Welcome to our course class today, Messianic Covenantal Spirituality, MCS. We're talking about our growth journey in Messiah likeness. So today we are going to begin working through the class material. You have two handouts that should be on your table. One is a summary of today's lesson, and one is assignments for week two for your kingdom experiments. Does everybody have those? Great. Does everybody have their textbook? Does anybody not have their textbook? So I say, meaning you don't have one at all? I didn't bring it. Okay, that's fine. You don't need to have it here today. Just want to make sure everybody has their textbook. Very good. So today, we're going to start with repentance. And we're going to look at repentance as our journey home. Remember, we're talking about Messianic covenantal spirituality, our journey of growth into Messiah likeness. So, if you look on your lesson plan for today, there's Hebrews 6, 1 through 2 uh, on that page. So we're going to read that. Therefore, leaving the basic teaching of the Messiah, let us move on toward maturity. So maturity means completeness or perfection. Biblical Hebraic world, perfection means wholeness and completeness. It's relational. Perfection is relational from a Hebraic biblical worldview. Uh, for us, it is living fully in the story. Our lives fully immersed, fully integrated into the gospel story of King Yeshua. To be fully in union with this story, fully immersed, fully living in it. Our whole lives caught up in God's story is connected to the idea of what maturity would look like for us. It's about union with God and His people and fulfilling our calling as image bearers. Maturity happens as Messiah is formed on the inside of us, conforming us to his image. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, forms the Messiah in us, conforming us to his image. We could say restoring us to the image of Messiah. So, when he says, let us move on toward maturity, it's a beautiful concept. It's a beautiful invitation. He goes on to say, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and trust in God, of teaching about immersions, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So the Ruach HaKodesh inspired Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, and he made it clear for every generation what the basic teaching foundations of Messiah are. So the Spirit deemed it really important that we have these foundations of the king and his kingdom in our lives if we're going to journey towards wholeness, if we're going to journey towards completion, if we're going to journey towards greater experience of union with God and union with his people and fulfilling our covenant vocation as image bearers on the earth. So he's inviting us, he's calling us onto this path Salvation is a path. Salvation is a journey. It has the decisive beginning and it has a destination. And that decisive beginning starts with what? It starts with repentance. Repentance is the decisive beginning of the journey into experiencing the salvation that God has provided in Yeshua the Messiah. Repentance from False worship, we could call that idolatry. Repentance from everything that flows from idolatry, which in Judaism, there's two main categories of sin that flow from idolatry. There is the shedding of innocent blood, 
This is kind of the, the murder category of sin, right? And there's lots of branches that grow on that tree. And then there's the uh, sexual immorality you know, side that, that grows out of idolatry, and there's lots of branches on that tree. So repentance is our journey home. Now I want you just to close your eyes for a minute while I read this story that captures the heart of repentance. So close your eyes and picture this. Repentance is a journey home. It is a journey that has a decisive beginning and a clear destination. It is moving in a direction. That direction is towards home with our Father and his people, restored to our place of dignity, authority, and power. It is like being off in a far country in exile from your homeland alienated from your father and stripped of your dignity, authority, and power, you realize you have lost your way, doing things you are not supposed to be doing, becoming a person you never dreamed of becoming. You come to your senses, seeing how your indulgent and cumulative choices have compounded to bring you so far from home. You desire to return to the father's house. You desire to be restored to him. You question how you will be received. You doubt whether he will want you back, yet your mind is clearly changing about where you want to be, who you want to be, and what direction you're going to travel in. So you start your journey home. Feels like a risk. Will I have a place? Find connection, meaning, and fulfillment? Will I find my purpose? You don't have all the answers, but you start your journey home, determined to make it to your destination. Even when you are a long ways off, your father sees you from a distance. He looks at your returning to your home, to him. He feels compassion for you. Even though it is not proper for him to pull up his robe, showing his bare legs, he sacrifices his reputation in order to restore your dignity. You are worth it to him. He runs to you. He meets you where you are, even at the beginning of your journey. He embraces you, falling on your neck with tender joy. He kisses you as his beloved child. You can feel the warmth of his embrace. He then walks with you all the way back to his house. He then, with you a little embarrassed, celebrates you openly, unashamedly, unreservedly, for you have returned from exile to your home, from alienation to him, from destitution to your dignified stewardship of authority and power. You were lost, but now you're found, you're home. Based in Luke 15, 11 through 22. Repentance is to change our mind, to turn, in order to return and be restored. Repentance is to change your mind, to turn, in order to return and be restored. Returning to be restored to our home, to relationship with God and his people, and to our stewardship, sharing in his rule and reign over creation as his sons and daughters. The way I came up with this definition of repentance, you can see this in footnote 5, is this is a synthesis definition from the Hebrew. Turn, return, restore is the meaning of the Hebrew word for repent. And then the Greek, to change your mind. So I started with the Greek, to change your mind, and then I rooted it back into the Hebrew. And it's fine to do it the other way too. But that's where I got that definition. But we need to put repentance back into the biblical story context. And the story I read helps us to look at repentance in the context of the biblical story. And in the context of the biblical story, repentance is our journey home. Repentance is our journey back into relationship. Repentance is our journey back into our stewardship. So, when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, 
We see the beginning of the story. And then in Genesis 3, we see the fall of humankind. So when we think about the fall of humankind from where they were at in Genesis 1 and 2, what does it mean to be restored? If they've fallen, what does it mean for them to get back up on their feet? What does it mean to, to go back and to be able to start over? Well, repentance is the journey back to the beginning. Repentance is the journey back to home, the journey back to relationship, the journey back to our stewardship. It's important that we see repentance in the biblical storyline and not over-Greek it as just a definition. Because if we're going to be on this journey of growth toward Messiah-likeness, it's important that we understand the role of repentance in that journey. Make sense? So let's begin to think about this. It's important that we notice that forgiveness of sins, which is through the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, is given when we start our journey of repentance. God does not withhold forgiveness until we're advanced in our progress. This is very important. And this principle is also true as we're continuing our journey of repentance. When we get off the path, the principle is the same. Right when we return to the path, we start our journey back on the path, He forgives us before we get everything sorted out. He doesn't forgive us once we get everything sorted out. I was uh, doing some evangelism with a young man recently, and he had a lot of things in his life that needed to be sorted out. He had a lot of disorder in his life. And through the lies of man-made religious system, he thought he had to get all that fixed and all that sorted out before he could start his journey of repentance as a disciple of Yeshua. And I was able to help him start his journey as a disciple of Yeshua. That if he started his journey of repentance, God would forgive him through Yeshua the Messiah. And God would walk with him to help him sort out the mess of his life. So this is really important principle. If we're going to grow into wholeness, if we're going to grow into Messiah-likeness, then we must not forget this foundational teaching, this foundational principle, that when we start our journey of repentance, either at the beginning, when we started our relationship with the Lord, or when we get off the path and we need to get back on the path, God comes to us and forgives us and embraces us and calls us His beloved. Amen? So let's think about this journey of repentance. So first, repentance is returning home, back to Eden, heaven and earth. So home is the place where God's ruling and reigning presence is fully lived under and delighted in. Home is heaven on earth in God's paradise garden. Remember Abraham? when he began to journey back east, right? He went east. When God's voice spoke to him, Abraham began to follow Adonai east. He began to journey back towards Eden. The land of Israel was, was a new Eden. It was a new Eden. And Abraham, in response to God's voice, he was beginning his journey back home. To, the God's, to God's uh, home in the land of Israel, which was to be a place, which was to become a place where heaven was on earth. And that's exactly what the temple became. Because remember, in the biblical worldview, the temple is where heaven and earth intersect. So the temple that was later built in Jerusalem, replacing the, the, the tabernacle and the wilderness wanderings, was the place where heaven and earth intersected intermingled, interlocked. It was a picture of a new Eden. It was a picture of a place where God would walk with man. Abraham, when he began his journey, as he's moving east, I love how the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 presents it. Remember, it talks about Abraham was looking for a 
a city, a homeland. And he's talking about the heavenly city, meaning Abraham was looking for the heavenly city to come down on the land of Israel. He was looking for, for a restored Eden in the land of Israel. He was looking for heaven to come to earth in the land of Israel. It's pretty amazing how in the biblical story we see even Abraham's journey of following the Lord was a journey to home. And this is true for us too. We're on a journey toward home. Now, our repentance journey is going to reach a destination when we are fully restored to our home in the age to come. Our repentance has a decisive beginning and our repentance journey has a destination. Meaning, we are repenting all the way back home. We are in this journey until we're, until we're fully back home and God's kingdom is fully on earth as it is in heaven. In Israel and the nations, we're fully not home yet. So we are on this journey. Our repentance journey is a process. And it's a process to get back home. God's calling us home. When he calls people to repentance, he's calling them home. To return from exile. Come home. I want you. I want to live with you forever. Turn from counterfeit gods and come home. I'm calling you home. It's a beautiful message. Repentance is a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful thing. We need to return the joyous sound of the word repentance. It's a calling back into our story. It's a calling back home. To come on a journey back home. To come back from exile and return and be restored to your home, heaven on earth. And this is a foundation, an apostolic foundation in the book of Hebrews. A foundation of Messiah's teaching, kingdom teaching. This foundation of repentance, you could see why the enemy would want to distort the message of repentance. If this is a foundation, a building block, in which we need in our lives to come to full completion, to come to full wholeness, to come to full maturity. You can see why the enemy want to corrupt this word repentance and make it an ugly religious word. But it's not. It's not. It's a beautiful word. So repentance also is this returning to oneness. So it's returning home and it's returning to oneness with God and his people. It's returning to being God's beloved. It's returning to our identity as God's beloved. You are God's beloved. Just like Yeshua, his son, is called beloved. Well, in Yeshua, Abba calls us beloved. Repentance is a restoring of our identity as God's beloved in covenant relationship with him. It's calling us back into love. Repentance is calling us back into falling in love with God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Repentance is a call to fall in love with God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Come journey into love and being my beloved. Come journey into falling in love with me until all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is madly in love with me. This is repentance. Come fall in love with your Creator. Because He loved you first. In Messiah Yeshua crucified, risen, ascended, and returning. All expressions of the Creator's love for us. All expressions of Him wooing us into the story, wooing us back into oneness, wooing us back into relationship, wooing us back into love. It's a journey back into oneness. Once again, this will be complete in the age to come, in the world to come, where we will have oneness with God as a family. Repentance is not just a journey 
back to oneness with God, but it's a journey back to oneness with God and His people. If the two most important commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, then foundationally repentance must have a trajectory. The journey of repentance must have a trajectory of growing us in love for God and neighbor. Therefore, repentance as a journey is a journey to fall in love with Adonai, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and a journey of loving our neighbor. Anybody complete on that journey of loving their neighbor? I'm not, but we're on a journey of falling more in love with God and loving our neighbor as herself. Repentance is a journey back into oneness with God and his people. Next, repentance is returning to our stewardship, being sons and daughters, sharing in God's rule and reign. Remember, I give you what? Dominion. So he's sharing in his, uh, he's sharing his rule and reign with his sons and daughters. Amazing. And since we're looking at repentance in the context of the story, the journey of repentance isn't just a journey back home. It's not just a journey back to oneness. But built on that, it's a journey back to our stewardship. Journey back to ruling and reigning with the king on the earth. And we're learning now to rule and reign with him. We're ruling and reigning over sin. We're ruling and reigning over sickness. We're ruling and reigning over disease. We're ruling and reigning over demons. We're ruling and reigning over our own bodies. <laughs> trying, to, trying to learn how to rule and reign over our own bodies, our speech, our thoughts, you know, in our relationships so that we're ruling and reigning in servant love. We're learning, but we also have spheres that we're learning to rule and reign with Yeshua over. Spheres of family, spheres in our vocation, spheres in the community, spheres in intersections with society. So we are learning now. We're on this journey back to our God-given stewardship. So we want to look now at more of the story related to the vision of Israel's prophets. The vision of Israel's prophets in light of the world where it was at, in light of the election of Israel for the sake of restoring the world, in light of that, Israel's prophets, they began to see a vision that was rooted in the patriarchal covenant. Remember, the patriarchal covenant was about the creation of the people of Israel, but also making all the peoples of the earth come together in, in blessing, come together with Israel, right? So the prophets, based on this covenant and even developmental, developmental material in the Mosaic Covenant, they begin to see a vision of, of, of the kingdom coming to Israel, the kingdom that would come for the whole world. And this coming victory over evil would be through the promised son of David. The son of David would reign as king over Israel and the nations by the anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There would come a king, a son of David, who would reign as the Messiah, as the king, in the power of the Holy Spirit, delivering Israel from their enemies, and then through Israel, bringing the nations to the knowledge of God, which would ultimately lead to a restoration of all creation. And the prophets were burning with the fire of God's word, burning with a vision for God's world to be restored. And, and the purpose that God chose Israel for was for the restoration of this world. And it would be the son of David who would be the chosen agent to bring about this restoration, who would bring about uh, this process of Israel and the nations returning to their home. Heaven on earth and the land of Israel and the whole earth. Restoration to God himself, oneness with God and his people. And restoration to their stewardship, sharing in God's rule and reign over creation. And this restoration would happen through the new covenant. And the prophets envisioned this restoration. 
Now, when we get into the first century, there was different Jewish groups that had different expectations developed of how this would come about. So at the time of Yeshua, these different Jewish groups had competing perspectives and competing agendas. We could call them kingdom of kingdom agendas of how this promise would be fulfilled. Tension was at a all all time high in the first century. Expectation, anticipation of the Messiah was at an all time high. Revolution was was breathing in the air. Did you know one of the hotbeds of violent revolution was in the very city Yeshua lived in, in Nazareth? It was a hotbed of revolution. Just a generation before, dozens of people were crucified by the Romans for revolting. He, he grew up in a place that had a history of revolution. And that was one of the strongest agendas, the kingdom agendas of the time. But there's different agendas, and there's more that I can get into right now. But the Pharisees thought if all Israel would follow their interpretation of Torah, which called for extensive ritual purity for temple participation, God would fulfill his promise. The Essenes thought if all Israel would follow their interpretation of Torah, which called for extensive separation from corrupt, corrupt temple leadership, God would fulfill his promise. See the contrast? <coughs> Competing agendas. The Zealots thought if all Israel would follow their interpretation of Torah, which called for eliminating the impure pagans from the land, God would fulfill his promise. So you have the Pharisees saying, listen, we need to elevate the expectations. We need to add to God's Torah and go above and beyond. Let's have all the Jewish people be called to a level of ritual purification that only the priests were expected of in the temple. Then God will see our devotion going above and beyond the law and He will send the Messiah and He will come and deliver us from evil. He will restore Israel and then His kingdom will go out to all the ends of the earth. That's what the Pharisees saw. The Essenes, they saw that the the priestly line had been corrupted and the people ruling the temple were the wrong people. So they decided to separate from the temple system. So to them, according to their interpretation of the Torah, they wanted to separate from what they saw, the corrupt practices and the corrupt operation by illegitimate people running the temple. So their interpretation called for a separation. They were more of a monastic community. They went out into the desert, the place where John the Immerser was preaching. This was a similar context to where the Essenes, the Qumran community where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, they had a major hub there. So some people would come out for a couple year process of training and, and immersion into the community, then they would go back into other parts of Israel. So people didn't just necessarily live there permanently. But they saw that the son of David would come wage a war, including against many of their Jewish people that they saw as apostates. Apostates. So they saw themselves as the righteous remnant. They even saw their community as a temple of God. Not the temple. They saw their community, the people, as a temple of God. Sound familiar? This was a Jewish group who saw this. But they were expecting a mighty warrior son of David to come wage war against the sons of darkness with some of their people included in that category. Especially killing off the Romans, of course. But that was their thinking. But they saw that as a war that the Messiah would enter into and do the battling. For the most part, a little different than the Zealots who wanted to take the sword in their own hands. And their interpretation of Torah was, we need to rid the pagans from our holy land. We need to destroy the pagans. And you know what? The traitors among the Jewish people, this is from their perspective, well, they might have to get killed too. The tax collectors working for those Romans. 
So they had quite a sense of hostility even toward their own people that they saw as conspirators with the Romans. This is the context for Yeshua's announcement of the kingdom of God. You ever been in a tense environment, a tense room where a lot of different opinions? Well, Yeshua walked into a, a very intense environment in first century Israel. When he came to bring his announcements of the kingdom, he brought a perspective that had some affirmations of all the other perspectives. It wasn't a total rejection of all the perspectives, but he had a very overall different kingdom agenda. Yeshua came in the Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now is the fullness of time. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of the heavens is at hand. So Yeshua, Israel's king, had a different kingdom agenda. So in love for Israel, he called them to repentance. And listen to this. He called them to follow him and his way of being Israel. He showed them how to be Israel. He showed them how to live as Israel. He said, follow me. This is how you be Israel. Watch me. Learn from me. Model your way of being Israel after my embodiment of the way of being Israel. So his message of repentance included giving up any kingdom agenda and interpretation of Torah that didn't line up with his. His message of repentance included giving up any kingdom agenda and any interpretation of the Torah that didn't line up with his. The revolutionary kingdom agenda, let's kill all the Romans. People had to give that up if you wanted to follow Yeshua. That's not the violent who are going to inherit the promise of the earth. It's the meek. And he said, I'm the meek one. You have to follow my ways of meekness if you want to participate in the promised kingdom coming to earth and your inheritance in that kingdom in the Holy Land. So Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. He was the way back home. He was the way back to oneness with God and God's people. He was the way to be restored to their stewardship of dignity, authority, and power. So to summarize, it's through Yeshua heaven began to come to earth. Heaven began to come to earth. So to respond to his call of repentance means journeying now into living in heaven on earth now. That the call of repentance is to follow him. Yeshua was living according to the world to come in the present evil age. Yeshua was bringing the ways of the age to come and living them out in the present evil age. And his followers are called to learn how to live in heaven on earth now by following his ways. The journey of repentance is a journey of learning to live in heaven on earth now. Yes, it'll be completed in the world to come, but it's now that we get to begin to experience heaven on earth. We get to experience and live in the powers of the age to come, as Hebrews calls it. We get to live more and more being conformed to the image of Messiah. And as we're conformed to the image of Messiah, we're actually living more and more in heaven on earth now in this age. And likewise, following Yeshua is this journey into oneness with God and his people. So as we, as people who love Yeshua, journey on this journey of repentance, we should be getting closer to God and closer to his people. And lastly, we've already talked about this. We're learning to rule and reign with Yeshua now. 
which will be brought to fullness when he returns in the age to come. So, theologically, this is all happening through the new covenant that was ratified in King Yeshua's blood for Israel and the nations. And remember, after his death, burial, and resurrection, Yeshua commissioned his growing remnant of Israel to call the nations into this journey of repentance with them. So evangelism includes the message of repentance, right? We're calling people to come journey with us on this journey of repentance back home, back to oneness, back to our stewardship. We're calling people into our story, which is King Yeshua's story, where all of our personal stories are redeemed and they're brought to fullness and completion in his story. We'll talk more about this next week. So we're to tell of the saving story of King Yeshua, the gospel, making disciples of all nations. This is our story and this is our journey. Questions? Glad you're blessed. Any questions? Let me say a couple words. So this, this journey is a journey for Israel and the nations. It's a journey for Jew and Gentile. And because this journey of repentance is a journey to oneness with God and his people, as we're making progress in the journey, what should be happening? Jew and Gentile should become more and more and more together, but not in homogenization. Just like, just like in the Godhead, they mutually indwell one another, but without confusion of identity. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Father and the Son are not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father and the Son. There's no confusion of identity in their relational unity. There's no blurring of their identity in the relational unity. There's no obscuring or obliterating their identity. That being Jewish and being Gentile are beautiful identities that are to coexist in God's kingdom of shalom in and through the son of David. Being male and female are not obliterated in the kingdom. They're beautiful identities that coexist in the kingdom of Shalom through the Son of David. Even in the age to come, where it talks about all the nations will bring their glory into the new Jerusalem. The nations still exist. Israel will still exist. The land of Israel will still exist. The territories of the earth will still exist. But there'll be a oneness, a relational unity as they share in the unity of the Father and the Son by their inbreed spirit in us. It's amazing. Our salvation is amazing. It's amazing. So we're starting this, this course to encourage us to really see this journey of repentance as a good thing. And if, and if we're all on a journey of repentance, shouldn't we give both affirmation and appropriate encouragement to one another? Meaning, if you find imperfections in Richard Cleary, you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't be surprised. When we find imperfections in each other, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be shocked. We don't need to be offended. Because together, we're on a journey. Now, if we, if we get off course, we need to repent. We need to get back on the path, receive forgiveness, receive affirmation from the Father of our belovedness. I want to speak to this. One of the biggest errors that we can fall into, one of the biggest traps of legalism, 
is when we feel unworthy and we try to make it up through good deeds in order to get to the place where we can feel like God's beloved again. That is taking a wrong path. That is taking a wrong path. When did the father run after his son? When he was a long ways off. When he was starting his journey. When he made that decision to start trekking back home. That's when the father saw him from a long ways off. That's when the father ran to him. That's when the father felt an overwhelming compassion for him. And he embraced him. He wrapped his arms around his neck and kissed him. And walked him back to his house. It was when he started the journey. When you start the journey of repentance, you come into your identity as God's beloved. And we can never mature beyond our need of this. It is foundational. Part of being in a covenant relation with God is being His beloved, being loved first, so that we can fall more and more in love with God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors or self. So you are God's beloved. On this stage of your journey of repentance, you are God's beloved today. Let all lies that speak otherwise be shattered if you're willing. Make sense? And we've got to reinforce our belovedness to each other. We can't, we can't make it very far if we're not habituated at the conscious and unconscious levels of our belovedness before our Father in Heaven. You'll read in your book next week on chapter, chapter 4 about Yeshua's spiritual formation as a young boy up into adulthood and how even Yeshua experienced rejection as a young boy. And as a human, he would have developed a human consciousness. He would develop the human consciousness of his belovedness in the Father. And as a human, we have to develop that. And we want it so ingrained at our subconscious level, not just our conscious level. Could you imagine living your life and speaking and interacting and making decisions and doing all your relationships and doing your job without even thinking about it really? That you are God's beloved and that was affecting everything you're doing and saying? I still struggle a lot with insecurity sometimes, and I have to be really intentional and conscious about remembering I'm God's beloved. So it's not even, it's not even permanently in my conscious thought yet. Imagine how transformed we could be in our unconscious thought. And that's God's goal for you. Because being conformed to the image of Yeshua is also being conformed in your consciousness to his consciousness. Having the mind of Messiah, knowing your beloved, at all the levels of your mind, conscious and subconscious, the Holy Spirit can do that in us. Part of our journey of repentance is seeing that habituated in us. Pretty cool. All right, any questions before we close? It's exciting, right? Repentance is getting good, right? <laughs> Who wants to repent? <laughs> yeah. Is your house big enough for the discussion group? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I think it's, I don't know, maybe one-fourth or one-third are doing it. And there's two groups, so. Yeah, should be good. And if we, you know, end up needing to do another group, we'll just do that. So, please, uh, I, would, I would look at your assignments for this week early in the week. All right? That's like, you know, today or tomorrow, if you can. Look at them early so you don't get behind. First submissions for your written thing are tomorrow night by midnight. I've already been getting some of them. They're great. Thank you so much. Uh, think of it more of as a creative writing assignment. Just share what God's doing in your life. Share what you want to share, what God's doing in your life. doesn't have to be, you know, you're not getting a grade, A, B, C, D, or anything like that. Just, just a completion. I just want to know what God's doing in your life. Share with me. Share your heart. Feel free. Let this be a redeeming experience. If you have education wounds, we want this to be a... We want this to be... Like, for example, real briefly, because of my upbringing, I developed a consciousness, uh, a sense of identity that I was very dumb. I wasn't smart. I was very dumb. I was unintelligent. I was dumb. 
strongly. I believe that with all my heart. It's very painful. Very painful. When I got saved, I ended up, the Lord had to use three different people who didn't know each other to confirm I was supposed to go back to school and, I was supposed, and they all said the exact same school. They didn't know each other. So I went to a school in Florida, Southeastern University, and I remember, I remember the first time I got all A's on my report card. I was just weeping and crying because for so long I believed I was so stupid. I believed I was so stupid. And I, I hope, I hope if anybody struggles with lies about you're not intelligent, you're not smart, you're stupid, it's not true. God made you uniquely intelligent. Your intelligence is different than everybody else's, but you are intelligent. So I want you to experience wholeness even in these deep psycho-emotional ways as you journey toward Messiah-likeness. Don't forget, it's also a journey towards emotional wholeness. Amen.